now? Good morning! We are glad that you are here today. Aren't you glad that it's warm in God's house this morning? I am really, really, really... Hold on a minute. Let me get that tightened down there. I am really, really, really this close to turn on the air conditioning because I'm already warm. How many are with me? How many are warm? All right, we got the five, the five warms have it. Let me turn the air on. But no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But uh, we are glad that you are here today. Uh, you should have gotten a message this week on the phone. If you didn't, uh, please, if it just didn't ring and didn't show up, let me know because then we don't have you on our list. But we should have everybody on here except Michelle. Uh, good to see you, Michelle. But um, we're going to do things a little bit differently for a little while. We're trying some things out with our kids uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we want our kids to be exposed to big church, if you will. And, and we want them to be able to meet some of you as well, because some of you didn't even know we had kids. Because they're always over there, you never see them. And uh, so they're going to be in here with us for the first portion of the service. We're going to sing together with them. And then every week, our kids are going to help us teach a song to the old people. All right, they're going to teach some songs, some of them that you might know from your childhood. There'll probably be some with actions, and by the time we're done, all the people will be going, oh, I need oxygen, but that's fun, all right? So we'll have a good time, and then we'll have a little, little Bible time with the kids as well uh, uh, up here during our service. So I just wanted to kind of make you aware of that. So parents and, and grandparents, if you bring kids from, from now on until we decide to change something or try something different, uh, just do like you did this morning. Just bring them right in. Uh, they'll sit with you for a few minutes. We'll have them sing, and I'll bring them up here to the platform here a little bit to sing with us as well. Uh, but make sure you get checked in there at the, at the table and get your pager. Uh, that pager is so when your kid goes crazy, they can come and get you. All right, no, I'm kidding. But uh, just... <laughs> Your kids are always good, but uh, just keep an eye on that if you would. And uh, make sure you return that when you... Uh, I told my wife, I said, I would tell them they can't get their kid back if they don't bring the pager, but then she's like, they'll all just take the pagers home. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I'm kidding. Bring your pager back in and uh, check in at the door. That courtyard there is now usable. That door, that's where you want to go to pick them up. And uh, their workers will take them over here in just a few minutes. Okay, so let's have prayer. Uh, and then we're going to jump right in. And, and again, a totally new schedule for this morning. But uh, I think it'll be great. And just looking forward to worshiping God with everybody this morning. So let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you for today. Thank you for your many blessings in our lives. Thank you for the privilege we have to serve you, to love you, to worship you, to call you. God and to know that you love us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us and for our sins and we pray that you'll bless our church service now as we worship you as we sing as we praise Lord as we preach as all that we do today we ask that you'll be lifted up and glorified this morning and we ask these things in Christ's name amen amen real quick any very first time guests very first time we want to greet you this morning very first time very first time how many of you kids are looking at people and saying I've never seen these people before all right, a bunch of you kids are thinking, I know, they're all first-timers to me. Copper, I, he knows, right? All right. Good to have Michelle. I mentioned her already back. She used to be with us for years and moved to Florida, came back here, and she's like, what happened to the weather? But anyways, uh, but uh, good to see her back with us as well. So, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to play our five-minute countdown video. And kids, you've never seen this, so what we do is we spend five minutes. We go to the bathroom if we need to. We get a drink if we need to. And we shake hands and just tell everybody, welcome to church, all right? Kids, what I want you to do is this. I want you to find some adults that you don't know and go tell them your name and shake their hand, okay? Can you do that, kids? Because there's some adults in here who don't know who you are, okay? Go, go introduce yourself and say, hi, my name is Bill, or whatever your name is, okay? Don't say your name is Bill if it's not Bill. Uh, he's ready to go. Is that Maverick? Jason? <laughs> Jason's ready to roll, man. I love this kid. Come here, Jason. Come here, Jason. Jason, come here. Come here. Come here. Let's show him how to do this. Hi, who are you? His name's Jason. Good. All right. See, that's what we're going to do. All right. Ryan, go ahead and start our video. Five minutes, we'll get settled back in, and we'll get the rest of our service going this morning. All right. God bless you.
If you'll find your places, we are ready to sing. Oh, boy, I think we need a 10-minute video. Good grief. <laughs> All right, come on in. Find your places. You can be seated. If anybody is standing up, everybody look at them and say, sit down. No, don't do that. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. Let me get my clicker going here and... We're gonna um, we're gonna sing this morning, all right. Now we're gonna do things a little bit differently, all right. Our first couple of songs are gonna be a little peppy, a little bit peppy, all right. So <laughs> everybody get a deep breath, all right. Um, let me get back to the beginning here. Can you put me on that first one, Ryan? You got it. All right, thank you. Ryan's gonna take care of it. Uh, we'll sing a couple uh, uh, quicker songs, and then kids. Kids, hang on, okay, because you guys, you guys are going to come help us in just a minute, okay? And get used to this because we're going to want you to help us with this on a daily, well, a weekly basis, all right? And uh, so we're excited about that, all right? So we're going to start off this morning with what a mighty God we serve. Isn't that true this morning? Amen. Amen. And I want you to sing. There are three key changes here. So bear with us. Jump in. Sing out loud. And 
get a breath before we start, okay? All right, here we go. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. drag this one here we go this is the day this is the day this is the day that the lord hath made that the lord hath made we i will rejoice. rejoice we I will rejoice, rejoice and be glad in it and be glad in it oh this is the day that the lord hath made we will rejoice and be glad in it this is the day this is the day the Lord hath made. All right, hold on a minute. All right. I sent out a message to you all that we we're going to do something a little bit different with our kids um, because I wanted you to be aware, first of all, that they'd be in here. So as you came to plan a seat, you might know somebody might be in yours, and that's okay. Uh, but also, I just want us to realize that without that, this will cease to exist. Amen. That's right. And uh, if we don't train the next generation, uh, to, to pick up the mantle and serve Jesus and love Jesus, uh, the church is going to be in trouble in 20 years. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's why we do that. It gives them a chance to meet you, you to meet them, you see them, them hear uh, the gospel uh, here besides there, and then you know, see us worshiping God together uh, as, as a corporate body. So I hope, I hope that uh, you enjoy that time, and uh, we allow God to use that in our lives as we get to know Him. What a blessing it is to be able to invest in the lives of children. Amen. Amen? And I would encourage you, you adults that saw some of them, uh, pick one of them out, okay, and uh, invest in their life. Just, just decide. That kid right there, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless. I'm going to be good to. I'm going to teach. I'm going to train. I'm going to take them under my wing. And I'm going to show them some things like somebody did to me when I was a kid. Amen? Amen. And uh, so I encourage you to do that. So we're going to start with some scripture this morning, and then we'll get into some songs uh, that we'll sing, kind of some worship to get us ready for uh, the preaching of God's word together this morning. So this first set of scripture we'll all read together. Uh, I'm going to do a set at the end after we're done singing. I'll read by myself. But if you'll read these with me out loud this morning, and then we'll get into a, a few songs that we'll sing together uh, today. Luke chapter number 19. The Bible says this is for number 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass... When he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why did ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. Can I stop right here? I don't usually do this during the scripture reading, but <laughs> you, do you realize that every single person in this room the Lord hath need of? Oh, yeah. And the only thing that restricts him from, from fulfilling the need that he has for us is when we stay tied to something. Amen. And just like this donkey, I'm just going to encourage you this morning, just loosen up. <laughs> let go of your grip. Let go of some of the things you're tied to and let the Lord use you. Amen. 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 Look at verse 32. We'll read that together. And, and they that were sent went, went their way and found even, even as he had said unto them. them. And, and as they were loosing the colt, the, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And, and when, when he was come, come nigh, nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Slain 
from the foundation of the world for sinners crucified oh, holy sacrifice behold the lamb of god behold the lamb there is a Savior we serve this morning. Amen. You know, I'm so thankful that Jesus came and was born of a virgin, and we celebrate that on, on uh, Christmas, and I'm thankful that we, uh, you know, celebrate his death. Without that, we have no forgiveness of our sins, but I'm so thankful we don't leave a dead God. Amen. And I'm thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that we serve a risen Savior this morning. And uh, while, I'm, while I'm plugging it, I'll remind you later on we make announcements. But uh, this next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And we have a 6 o'clock a.m. sunrise service. Did you know there was a 6 a.m.? There is. And uh, sunrise service. And we're going to worship the Lord. We've got a 1030 service. And right afterwards, a big special thing planned for our kids. So I encourage you to come out next, next week as we think about the death and the entry and all that this week. Let's not leave out the resurrection, okay? If he's still in the grave, we're in trouble. And I'm glad we have a risen Savior. Luke chapter 23 says this, Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. By the way, he's speaking to the same people who just laid down palm branches and said, glorify Hosanna, king of kings. But they cried, saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him. And let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. The same king who was worshipped with palm branches was now 
destined for the cross as they cried, crucify him, crucify him. We're going to show you just a quick, about a minute video here about Palm Sunday. And as soon as that video is finished playing, uh, we'll get our Bibles open and get into the Word of God this morning. In the city of Jerusalem, whispers of anticipation are heard everywhere. The streets are alive with the news of the imminent arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus sends two of his disciples to fetch a donkey and its colt. He rides into Jerusalem, fulfilling what was foretold by the prophet Zechariah. As Jesus enters the city, a large crowd gathers to greet him, spreading their cloaks and palm branches on the road in a display of honor and reverence. The atmosphere is one of celebration. This is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the embodiment of hope and salvation for a weary world. The people cheer. They shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And whether they know it or not, as Jesus passes by them, they are witnessing the face of God in the humanity of this man on this borrowed donkey. This Easter, you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Hey, man, if you have a Bible, we're going to go to the Gospel of John, please, this morning. John chapter number 12. And I want to take your attention back this morning to some of the things we just sung about and to the video we just saw. And I want to, for the next few moments, I want to preach on the topic of from cheers to the cross. And uh, just like we read scripture a moment ago, we saw how they were so welcoming to the king, but yet they were the first ones to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. By the way, it did not take God by surprise. Amen. God knew from the beginning of time exactly what was going to happen, how it would unfold. I'm thankful that Jesus was willing to be the spotless lamb. Amen. Amen. John chapter number 12, if you found that and you're able to this morning, stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's word. We want to start in verse number 12. And then we'll read down to verse 15. And we're going to jump over to John 19. So we're going to stay in the same gospel. Uh, but we're going to jump over a few chapters here in just a minute to finish our reading. So look at John chapter 12 and verse number 12. And on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Go to John chapter 19, if you would, and look at verse number 14. Again, that's the cheering part, bringing the king to Jerusalem. And then look at John 19, look at verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. They just called him king a few minutes ago, remember? Behold, uh, king is here, right? But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We thank you so much for your blessings in our life. Thank you for Jesus who did die to save us. And thank you for the time we have to celebrate today. Uh, his entry into Jerusalem, Lord, the praises that he received, the cheers uh, that, that, that greeted him. But, Lord, then we shift our attention towards what happened uh, in God's designed master plan, which was for him to then die on the cross for our sins. 
And God, as we focus our attention on this for a few minutes, I just pray that you'll bless as we teach, as we preach this morning. May it be helpful to us. Challenge us, Lord. Uh, help us to learn and to grow in some areas of our life because of being here today. Uh, Father, we ask you, uh, if there's one here that's uh, in our service or even watching us online that does not know Christ as their Savior, Lord, I pray today would be the day that they would realize how much you loved them and that Jesus died for them. And if they would just turn to you, that you could save them right where they are if they would just allow that and step out in faith. Uh, Father, we ask you now to bless the time of preaching as we open your word. Uh, may I say exactly what you would want said. Empty me of sin and self, please, this morning, fill me with your spirit. And bless our, uh, this time that we have remaining. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Today we're going to embark together on a little bit of a journey back 2,000 some years ago. Uh, this journey is quite profound and it begins with cheers of jubilation and cheers of, uh, 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 of excitement. And it ends at the foot of the cross. It's a journey that really encapsulates our faith and the essence of our faith. It also reveals to us the, the transforming power of God's love. And I'm excited about this journey. Uh, but at the end of this, as we look at this, I also want us to be reminded, not only are we reminded of God's transformative power and his love, not only are we reminded of, uh, of our faith, we also need to be reminded of because of what Christ did, it ought, to lead, uh, it ought to lead us to having a profound devotion to Christ because of what he's done for us. You know, there's a lot of gods in false religions today that, that ask you to die for them or ask you to give for them. You know, Jesus is the one that says, I don't want you to die for me. I want you to live for me because I died for you. Uh, what, what a contrast this morning. I want you to join me, if you will, and give me your imagination and your mind for just a few moments this morning as we trace the path of Jesus and his disciples from the cheering and exciting crowds there on Palm Sunday as they're getting ready to enter Jerusalem to the solemnness and the brutality that he would then face at the cross. And I want to give you some lessons, hopefully, along the way. I want to start this morning at the triumphal entry that we read about in John chapter number 12. The triumphal entry, and we see these cheers of jubilation, these cheers of excitement, these cheers of, hey, Hosanna, the king is here. We're so excited to have him. As you step back into these events of Palm Sunday, uh, you're, you're greeted by these people that are showing uh, unparalleled joy and excitement. Man, these guys are thrilled that Jesus is there. The streets of Jerusalem are alive with a buzz and with anticipation of Jesus entering the city. He's riding on this donkey. The crowds have gathered to meet him. They've taken off their coats. They put palm branches in the, in the way and they're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king, right? What a, what a thrilling scene that must have been for Christ. What a thrilling scene that must have been for the disciples who, by the way, Christ you know, has been telling them now, hey, I'm only here with you for a while and I'm going to die. And they're thinking, oh, this, this, something must have changed. Look, all these people are excited to have him here. That's the triumphal entry. Uh, cheers of jubilation. And, and I see a couple things uh, being fulfilled in that. Uh, the first thing you see is a king's welcome. A king's welcome. You ever, you ever met some important person? I was going to say a, a politician, but yeah. Never mind. <laughs> What's that? Chuck, you met Chuck Norris? Shut up! Did you shake his hand? Have you washed your hand? I, oh, man. I want to shake your hand at the service, all right? She met Chuck Norris. Anybody else met anybody better than Chuck Norris? I mean, come on. It doesn't get much be better than Chuck Norris. Now, he's going to hear this wherever he is. You know that, right? Oh, no, Chuck Norris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chuck Norris. What's that? John, we met John Lee, really? Wow. That's, anybody else met anybody famous? Who'd you meet? Who? Who's that? Maybe I'm too young. Am I too young? Thank you. Thank you. I think I know who you're talking about. Okay. Anybody else make me famous? Bob? Jesus. That's the best one. Amen. Amen. Right? We'll get to him in just a minute. That's the, that's the true king. Amen. Amen. Anybody else make me famous? Who'd you meet? Who'd you meet, Michelle? Jessica Alba. Famous actor. All right. Actress. Actress. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Who else? Who else? Who'd you? Nancy? Okay. Tex Ritter. All right. Anybody else? I'm too young, yeah. I met Jamie Farr. You know who Jamie Farr is? Yeah. I met Jamie Farr. That's not a big deal, but um, I, actually, I actually have met several times our former vice president. Uh, uh, I met, met him several times, so that was kind of neat when he got chosen. I was like, hey, I know him. That's cool. But anyways, all right. So we've all met somebody famous. Of course, the best meeting we could ever meet is, like Bob said, Jesus. Amen. 
But when you meet somebody famous like that, of course, you probably stumble over yourself a little bit or that kind of thing. But, but, you know, when they plan an event where that famous person might come, they don't just like say, well, when he shows up, we'll just kind of uh, wing it when he gets here. If we got some water, you know, maybe we'll plan a meal last minute. All these things are planned and prepared ahead of time, right? Why? Why? Because they're greeting somebody who they consider famous or great or wonderful or whatever, okay? Uh, Think about this particular passage here. As Jesus entering into Jerusalem here, he receives a king's welcome. They're not there just saying, oh, Jesus, you're cool. They're throwing down palm branches. They're shouting, Hosanna, man. There's a buzz in the streets. Everybody's excitement. The long-awaited King Messiah is finally arriving. This is exciting for them. Can I just say something real quick this morning? It's not even in my outline, but I'm just going to say this real quick. We ought to be just as excited in the fact that we have this King Jesus in our lives. That ought to be just as thrilling to us. And we ought to be able to say, hey, I'm excited every day I wake up because Jesus is a part of my life. Amen. You see a king's welcome, palm branches strewn in the pathway, symbolizing victory, symbolizing honor. Uh, The crowd had laid their cloaks out before Jesus, acknowledging his royal authority in their lives. The king was in town, and they welcomed him with these cheers. As you think about this king's welcome and the triumphal entry, I also want you to think about the fulfillment of prophecy. This this account in John chapter 12 is a fulfillment of prophecy that was given in Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, Zechariah prophesied that this king would come, the Messiah would come riding on a borrowed donkey that wasn't his. And that's exactly what happened in Scripture. He foretold the coming of a humble and a righteous king riding on a donkey. And in John chapter 12, prophecy is fulfilled. You ever stopped and thought about prophecy? How many of you like prophecy? You, 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 anybody like prophecy? It's kind of cool to need that, look at in Scripture and sing. You know, the Bible says this is going to happen in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you see it happen. You're like, wow. And these guys live thousands of years apart. You're just like, wow, that's amazing, right? And even the prophecy that we have in Scripture about the end times, that's something we're probably all kind of current with right now because we look at the world in which we live and think, man, Jesus has got to come back soon, amen? <laughs> with everything going on. And you look at prophecies that are being fulfilled already and some that are still to come. And prophecy is a kind of a neat thing. Do you realize that Jesus... There were over 300 references to 61 specific prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah. Did you hear that? 300 references, 61 specific prophecies about the Messiah coming. Now, we are not going to take time this morning to look at all 300 references or all 61 prophecies. But I want to point out several real quick, okay? I'm going to give you eight of them. Micah 5, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Isaiah 7, he'd be born of a virgin. Uh, Jeremiah 23, he'd come from the line of David. Zechariah 11, he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Psalm 22, his hands and his feet would be pierced. Psalm 22, people would cast lots for his clothing. Zechariah 9, 9, he'd ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Malachi 3, 1, and a messenger would prepare the way for him. Those are just eight, okay? Now, I say that to say this. Those prophecies were written by different people in different places 500 to 1,000 years before Jesus was born. That's what makes it prophecy, okay? So, how many of you know somebody who doesn't like to believe the Bible? Yeah, that's just a story tale. That's a fairy. Hey, you know, men wrote that. that. Can I say this? There was a professor. His name was Peter Stoner, professor of mathematics, and he decided to test this whole prophecy junk in Scripture. So he got his students together, 600 students of math, And he gave them a probability problem to solve to determine the odds of one person just fulfilling those eight prophecies. One person fulfilling eight prophecies. By the way, that's not the same as flipping a coin eight times and seeing if you get heads. Okay, that's totally different. The students calculated first the odds of one person fulfilling all the conditions of one specific prophecy, such as being portrayed by you know by a friend for thirty pieces of silver. The students did their best to estimate the odds for all eight prophecies combined being fulfilled specifically by one person. They calculated the odds against one person fulfilling all eight prophecies, and they came up with an astronomical number. You ready for this? They said the chances of a person fulfilling all eight specific prophecies was one in ten to the 21st power. Now, some of you are like, I, 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 you lost me at one to ten, all right? 1 in 10 to, tw- 10 to the 21st power. 10 to the 21st power is 10 with 21 zeros after it. Y'all with me? That's, that's the mathematical side of the equation. One person can fill all eight of those, and the chances of that happening were 1 in 10 to the 21st power. 
Now, let me give that to you in simpler terms. You ready? Because this is what the professor came up with and said, well, let, let's explain this for the common person. Amen? He said this, take the entire land mass of the earth, take silver dollars, and stack them 120 feet high. Are y'all y'all with me so far? 120 feet high, silver dollars on the entire mass of the of the Earth's surface. Mark one of those dollars and randomly bury it. Then ask a person to travel the Earth and select that dollar while blindfolded from the trillions that are out there, and that is one to the ten to the twenty-first power. The odds of one person fulfilling just eight of those prophecies, mathematically speaking, are astronomical. Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy. And not just the eight, all 61. That's the king we serve. That's the king we love. That's the king we worship. That's the king. The arrival in Jerusalem marks the culmination of his earthly ministry. He's about to leave. He's finished helping people. He's finished preaching. He's finished raising the dead. and healing. His ministry is finished on earth. He's getting ready to leave. And he's fulfilled a mission. And now he's going to totally top it off and provide redemption and salvation to mankind. Let me look at number two. Number two, then, we lead us to the, to, as we continue our journey, uh, we, we leave that triumphal entry as he enters the and we go to the Last Supper. The Last Supper was a time of fellowship and farewells. As we move forward, uh, we go to the upper room, and Jesus shares a final meal with his disciples. Amidst this intimate fellowship, Jesus teaches his disciples a very powerful lesson in servanthood and in love. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being one of the chosen few to be in this Last Supper with Jesus? experiencing this one last intimate meal with the Messiah. As you think about the Last Supper, I want to give you two thoughts. First of all, I want you to look at the symbolism of Passover. This Last Supper took place during the Jewish festival of Passover. Passover, of course, is a time of remembrance and deliverance. Uh, Passover was a time where they would remember what Jesus did for them when they exited Egypt. You remember the story? They were slaves in Egypt. Uh, they, the, Moses came onto the scene, the ten plagues. In the last plague, they had to put the blood on the doorpost, right? And the death angel came, and if your blood wasn't on the doorpost, your firstborn was killed. If the, if the blood uh, was on the doorpost, the angel would pass over. And your family would, would be safe through that. And so every year now they would celebrate that time of Passover through a celebration. Uh, the Last Supper takes place and it's actually symbolism of Passover. He transforms this ritual that they've been doing for years. Uh, and he gives it new meaning. And he includes this time of communion, what we call it today, the Lord's Supper. And he tells them, listen, I'm going to die. I'm going away. But you have a time to remember me through the blood, the juice, and the bread my broken body. In a new form of deliverance, you're not being de delivered from Egypt's captivity, you're being delivered from the bondage of sin. You're being delivered from, from the power and the rule of Satan. That's the deliverance you're going to experience. And so when you think about this Last Supper, it wasn't just a meal. It wasn't just a time of fellowship. It was also a time of him teaching through this, and he taught them the symbolism of Passover. But secondly, we also see then him teaching an act of humble service. You know, in a profound, very, very profound display of humility, Jesus took on the role of a servant during this meal. And he washed his disciples' feet. Now again, you talk about sacrificial love. We're talking about a day and age where they didn't have closed-toed shoes. You ever done something and they said, oh, you can't participate unless you have closed-toed shoes? A factory, you've got to have steel-toed shoes, Right? And some place won't let you do anything if you're wearing flip-flops or sandals or things like that, right? Uh, uh, somebody else. One of our, oh, food pantry. If you ever worked at food pantry and showed up on sandals, they said, go put closed-toed shoes on or you got to go home. That's just, that's their, that's their rules of health thing, right? They didn't have closed-toed shoes. They didn't have bathtubs and soap like you and I have today. Y'all with me? Now, I'm just, I'm going to be crude. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little bit gross this morning, but them disciples' feet stank, All right, think about it. Think about it. Just, 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 just wearing your socks and shoes for day at the end of the day, if you're honest with yourself, you probably think, whoa, that, what's, oh, that's me. Right? I don't know too many people that go days and days without washing their, their feet, let alone their body, right? I mean, it's just, that's just what we do. They didn't have that access then. 
So Jesus is, is stooping. He's, he's, he's putting aside the crown, if you will. And he's picking up a towel, and he says, hey, I want to serve you, and I want to serve you not so I can say, oh, look what I did. I want to serve you to show you service is important. I want to serve you to show you that I love you, and I'm going to take a humble role, and I'm going to bow before you, and I'm going to wash your feet. I joke about this often. You've heard me say it many times if you've been here for the last few years, but I, 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 I'm not a foot guy, all right? I don't want to see your feet. I don't want to smell your feet. And I definitely don't want to touch your feet, all right? And vice versa. I don't want you touching mine, all right? That's just, that's just me. I don't, I don't, if, if you guys want to have a foot washing service, you can have it on the day of pastors on vacation, amen? Help yourself, all right? I'm being a little facetious there. But you know what I'm saying? It, this is a humiliating thing. It wasn't like, oh, who's getting to wash feet today? It's my turn. This was Jesus sacrificially saying, I will humble myself even though I am king of kings and lord of lords. And I will show you what it means to love. And I will show you what it means to sacrifice. And I'll show you what it means to be humble for the sake of others. Amen. See, the Passover, this, this last supper was more than just a meal. It was a teaching opportunity for Jesus. And through this act, Jesus exemplifies the essence of his ministry. To serve rather than to be served. To minister to rather than to be ministered to. And this act just exemplifies his purpose of coming. We leave the upper room in the meal that was shared and the lessons that were taught to the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is a picture of agony and surrender. Our journey is drawing nearer to its conclusion here, but we find ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus in the Garden is wrestling with the weight of his impending sacrifice. I do not believe any moment in Jesus' life he was thinking about not going to the cross. I don't believe Jesus was considering trying to get out of going to the cross. I believe Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane realized the weight that was going to be on his shoulders when he died on the cross. He realized that he was going to become sin. He realized that his own father would have to turn and not be able to look because of the sin that was placed upon his son. And he realized that separation was coming and that relationship that he had with the father was about to be separated. And when he realized that, it caused him agony. The Bible talks about how as, as he prayed in the garden prayer, he sweat great drops of blood as he prayed. This was a time of agony in Christ's life. Uh, he experienced a couple of things. First of all, the agony of the cross. Uh, in, in, in the darkness and the solitude of the agony, though, I want you to understand something. He still surrenders to the will of the Father. Do, do you realize this, Christian? Do you realize that you can go through hard trials that you don't enjoy and that you don't want to be a part of your life? You can go through those and you can pass them and, and, and come out the other side with flying colors if you go through them realizing that Jesus is going through them with you and that it's his plan for your life to be involved in that. I don't, I don't think Jesus was looking forward to the pain of the cross. I don't think Jesus was looking forward to be separating from the Father. But I do know this. As he was facing that agony, Jesus also knew the Father had a plan. The Father had a plan. In the garden, he experienced profound anguish and distress as he contemplates the cup of suffering that he's about to drink and the separation that awaits him. But in the midst of his anguish, he submits himself fully to the Father's will, surrenders his own desires uh, for the sake of humanity's redemption. Think about that for a minute. As he's praying, Lord, if it be real, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Do you realize that in that submissive act, he provided redemption for every single one of us in this room? He provided redemption for every single person in the universe that would accept him. Just through the submissive act as he faced the agony of the cross. As I think about this in Gethsemane, I also see the power of prayer. We talk about this in a lot of our churches, right? Pray, 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 pray. You have not because you ask not. You know, give God your burden. We talk about it all the time, right? But if we're going to be honest with ourselves as Christians, which we should be, right? Because God knows anyways. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, what's, what is usually the, 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 the thing that we lack to do most in our lives when we need to do it? <laughs> pray. We use it as a last resort instead of a first option many times. I've tried everything I know to do. I guess I'll pray. Man, it should start with, I'm going to pray and let God do the rest. Amen? 
The power of prayer is exhibited in Gethsemane. Jesus prays in the garden. He demonstrates the power of intimate communion with the Father, even in the face of overwhelming adversity. Jesus is praying and he's, he's pouring out his heart to the Father. They're experiencing this, this oneness, if you will, while he's praying. And Jesus is getting ready to face the cross. And he teaches us this. In the midst of your difficult circumstances, the power of prayer sure is amazing. The fellowship with God sure is refreshing. Man, the intimate relationship we should have with God sure is amazing. You ever stop and think about prayer? I know we do it, right? And we just pray for something because it needs to be prayed for. But you ever just stop and think about prayer? Do you realize how intimate that, re that is, that relationship? God the Father opens up his office. And as he's sitting on his throne says, you can enter. You're not holy. You're not righteous. You're not worthy. You don't deserve it to be in my presence. But I'll let you in because you're my child. And then he says this, I desire you. To come in. I'm not just opening it saying come if you want to. I'm saying this. Please come. Please enter. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Cast your cares upon me. I care for you. That's the intimate relationship and the power of prayer. Yet, 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 yet we throw it to the side and discard it so often in our Christian lives. The power of prayer shown in the Garden of Gethsemane through the person of Jesus Christ. Through prayer Jesus finds strength. Through prayer, Jesus finds determination. Through prayer, Jesus finds solace. Uh, he enables him to embrace the path that lies before him with courage and resolve. If anybody had a reason to back out right now, it was Jesus Christ. But after the prayer in the garden, and after suffering the agony, and after giving submission to the Father, what does he do? I'll press on. I'll press on. And by the way, lest, lest, lest you are confused... Even when he was on the cross, he had the power to call 10,000 angels to get him down. Yet he did not. And he stayed on that cross to deal with the sins of mankind. And to become the sacrificial lamb in the atonement for the sins of the world. The Garden of Gethsemane. Let me give you this last stop on our journey this morning. We started the triumphal entry. We saw the last supper. We went to the Garden of Gethsemane. That takes us to our final destination this morning, John chapter 19, the cross. The cross, of course, is a, a symbol and a reminder of sacrifice and salvation. Sacrifice and salvation. Our journey, as it concludes this morning, takes us to the foot of a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. This is the ultimate place and symbol of God's love and humanity's need and provision for redemption. Amidst the agony and despair of the cross is where we find hope, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Had Jesus not been willing to go through the sacrifice and the agony, we wouldn't be able to experience the hope that he provides. Amen? We wouldn't be able to have the sins forgiven that he provides. The, the washing of regeneration. Uh, the, the making us a new creature. We talked about with the kids this morning. We wouldn't be able to have uh, 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 us being brought into a relationship with the Father. Without Jesus suffering. And going through what he did through willingly. The cross. Sacrifice and salvation. I want to look at those two aspects this morning. First of all, I want to look at the sacrifice of love. The sacrifice of love. Do you realize Jesus did what he did for one reason? Love. He did not do it because, oh man, those people are worthy. He did not do it because he was commanded to or guilted into it. Jesus made the sacrifice out of love. Amen. On the cross, he offered himself a final sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice for the sins of humanity and he bore the weight of all the world's transgressions upon his shoulders you know up to this point the Jews every year had to offer a sacrifice 
And every year on a certain day called the Day of Atonement, they would bring the spotless lamb in and they would sacrifice it exactly the way Scripture taught them to. And they would put the blood on the altar and they would take some of the blood and they would put it on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. They would take a second uh, a, a lamb, a goat, and they would put blood on it and they would send it out in the wilderness. And it symbolized God uh, taking away their sins uh, away from them and giving them forgiveness for the next year until they offered the next sacrifice. And can you imagine being a Jew? Realizing that every year this sacrifice had to be made. And if somebody forgot, <laughs> or, or if the sacrifice wasn't right, or something was done wrong, my sins aren't forgiven. My sins aren't atoned for. My sins and the judgment of them are not pushed off for another year. I'm in trouble. Every year that Jewish altar would cry out, sacrifice, sacrifice sacrifice and when Jesus came to Calvary and they nailed him to an old rugged cross and they, they hung him there to die for the sins of the entire mankind and when Jesus said it is finished that Jewish altar toppled man that veil in the temple ran in two and Jesus said sacrifice complete it is finished Amen. no more lambs need to be killed no more blood needs to be shed the blood of the spotless lamb has been shed and that provides the redemption of all mankind. And he did it because of love. In his suffering and his death, Jesus reveals the depth of God's love for us. He demonstrates there's no greater love than a man lay down his life for someone else. I want you to stop and think about this sacrifice of love, okay? Because it's more than just one person involved. Jesus loved us enough to be willing to be the sacrifice. God loved us enough to give his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you see the sacrifice of love involved? It's not just like, well, Jesus, do you realize that it started with God the Father being willing to give his son to pay for crimes and sins that he did not commit? Huh? How many of you parents would let your child pay for the crimes of somebody else that they did not commit? Ain't no way, right? Uh -uh, I'll go to bat for the man. I'm going to die. No, how? They didn't do it. They shouldn't have to pay for it, right? Yet God said, I know he didn't do it. But because I love you all so much, I'll let him take your penalty. I'll, I'll let him take your beating. I'll let, him, I'll let him suffer in your place. God loved us. Jesus loved us. He was willing to take what he took. Do, do, you ever stopped and thought about, it's a good time of year to do it. You ever stopped and thought about the, the pain that this sacrifice entailed. It, it, they didn't just throw him up on a cross and say, okay, die. You know, before he ever faced the cross, he was beaten with a cat of nine tails. The kids, the kids over in Children's Center, they're learning about some of this this morning, and my wife made a cat of nine tails for him so she could kind of show him what it looked like and what it did. It only has eight, so I'm hoping they don't count. <laughs> she, she missed a strand, but it's all good. Boy, a cat of eight tails would be just as bad as a cat of nine tails, Amen. <laughs> And that, that you know, it wasn't. It, it, it's not literal cattails. You understand that, right? It wasn't like nine cats' tails tied together. You, you all got that? I'm just making. Now that would be. Never mind. I said that would be fun. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Peter, don't get after me. Anyways, but th this was like this was this this was like a a, a a a large piece of wood, like a, a baseball bat. Let's just put let's put it in proper perspective, right? And on that baseball bat was attached nine strands of leather. And embedded in that leather were pieces of glass and bones and, and, and metal and shards of anything you do. And, and two big old Roman soldiers would get on either side of this prisoner as he was either tied up like this or bent over a rock, one or the other. And, and, and they would dip that, that, uh, that, that thing in some sticky stuff, if you will, and get some more of those, the, the glass and shards and that kind of thing on there. Make it as good as they can so it would stick to the body as well. And they would take turns and one big old Roman soldier would wind up and swing that so those lashes would wrap around the body of that prisoner. And then came the pullout. And as they ripped that cat of nine tails back out, it literally would, would take flesh from the bone. Then another Roman soldier on the other side would say, hey, well, let me get him from this side. And he'd come around, he'd wrap it around the other side of that prisoner's body. And as he pulled it out, that flesh would be ripped from the bone. And they beat Jesus within an inch of his life. You know, the Bible says that the insides of Christ could be seen. The Bible says the, the appearance of Christ was hardly recognizable as a human being. That's how badly they beat him. 
And then they put a crown of thorns on his head and beat those crowns down into his, into his skull and those capillaries around his, his, his uh, uh, head. And again, you know, anytime your head or your eyes or your face begins to bleed, it's so much worse than any other cut that you can get. And blood began to pour down his, his, his head. Those little pictures of Jesus with a trickle down his, I wish they'd burn them all. He didn't have a trickle of blood running down his face. He was a bloody, gory, nasty mess. They put a robe on him to mock him being royalty. But you know what they did before they went to the cross? They ripped the road back off. And if you think about the time of that robe being attached to those bloody wounds and the time to be ripped off, those bloody wounds, some of them had time to heal a little bit and dry up a little bit, which then stuck to the robe that they put on him. And then they ripped that robe off him and opened up all those wounds again. And they plucked his beard. I don't, I don't, I don't know how you ladies tweak your eyebrows. I pulled one the other day and I was like, ah! <laughs> I won't ask how many of you men do. I don't even want to know, but <laughs> you know? And it, can you imagine having just fistfuls of your beard just being yanked out? They, they smacked him with the palm of their hands. I don't know about you, John, but man, if you want to fight me, let's fight. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing fists. I ain't slapping you like a little girl. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Maybe I should fight somebody else. Anybody else want to fight? They'll slap me instead of punch me. You know what I'm saying. That, that's, like a, that's like a disrespect. If a man comes up to you and slaps you, man, that's huge disrespect. And they did it over and over and over to the Savior. They spit on him. They mocked him. They cursed him. And then they drove nails. I'm not talking about these little stupid nails we use in our wall. They drove spikes into his arms, his hands, his feet. And they attached him to a cross. That cross had a pre-dug hole most of the time. And they would attach the prisoner to the cross many times before. And as they lifted that cross and dropped it up into the hole... Can you imagine as you're being suspended by just three nails how badly it jarred the body of Christ? I imagine every bone in his body was probably out of joint. Yet as prophecy fulfilled, none were broken. While on the cross, they continued to mock him. The one who died beside him that, that, that he could have saved, one, one accepted and one still rejected Stuck a spear in his side. You see the little, little bit of cross we get a picture of, little blood trickle that we get a picture of. We think, oh, he died for my sins. Oh, I get to go to heaven. Man, it's so much more than that. The sacrifice of love that Christ displayed for you and for me. Not just so that we could be saved, because you get to go to heaven, that's great in and of itself but so that he could change us and mold us into the image of his son so that we could turn around and reach the world and reach other people with Jesus Christ. Amen. A sacrifice of love was shown at the cross. Then you also see the triumph of salvation. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus conquered sin. A sinless sacrifice conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered the grave, which we'll see next week. And he offered salvation and eternal life to anybody who fit in a certain category and checked off all the boxes like Pastor King. No, he offered salvation through this process to anyone who would accept. Young and old, tall and short, thin and not so thin, Right? White, black, red, yellow, green, orange, brown, purple, pink. Every language, every nationality, every tongue, every kindred. He said salvation's available to you. The cross today stands as a symbol of victory and a symbol of redemption. And it invites anybody to embrace it and, experiencing, and experience the, the, the transforming power of God's love, grace, and mercy. 
the question we have to ask ourselves as we conclude this journey from cheers to the cross is this. First of all, have we embraced the life-changing power of the cross? Have we experienced that relationship with the King of Kings? Can we learn some lessons from this journey? Can we be inspired by the humility that Christ shown and challenge us to be better servants and to show more love and to practice true humility? Can we follow his footsteps with courage and devotion and realize whatever situation, whatever circumstance Christ puts me in, I can rise victorious through it because of the King of Kings. As we think about Easter season, please, please, please remind yourself it's not about chocolate. Although chocolate's good, amen. amen. <laughs> it's not about our Easter extravaganza, although that's going to be a lot of fun for our kids. That's not what it's about. It's not about dressing up in fancy uh, spring colors. Amen. It's not about having family dinners and get together. There's nothing wrong with those things. That's not what it's about. It's about the love that Jesus Christ showed for us. The depth of his love. Respond with hearts full of gratitude and praise. What started with cheers led Jesus ultimately to the cross. I want my life to be resolved and committed to live for him because of what he did for me. Now, this morning, I'm going to say this and I'm done. We're not going to leave him in the grave. Amen? Because three days later, he rises again. Now, you're going to have to wait seven days to hear about it because it'll be next Sunday. But you all know anyways, right? He doesn't stay in the grave. That's what brings the ultimate victory in our lives. The death is wonderful, and it had to happen, but it doesn't work without the resurrection. Amen. We'll pick up there next week. Next week, I just want to encourage you again. Uh, at the end of our service here in just a minute, we're going to make some announcements. I'm going to give you guys some things, but uh, I want you to invite some folks out for Easter Sunday next week. Uh, that's one Sunday that people will come that will never come any other Sunday of the year. But somebody has to invite them. 82% of people come to church because of a personal invitation. Yet one in five Christians actively invite people. Did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> Get out and invite some folks to Easter. We're going to start a series next, uh, next Sunday on Easter. Resurrecting hope. Overcoming life's greatest challenges. And we're going to spend the next three weeks after Easter just talking about that resurrecting hope. So get them here for Easter, and then hopefully we can get them to come back and just realize the wonderful power of an amazing God if we'll truly give him our lives. I'm thankful for the cross, amen? But I'm so much more thankful for the empty tomb. We'll talk about that next week. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this journey we've been able to see through the cross, through the uh, Last Supper, through the Garden of Gethsemane, all the way back to the triumphal entry, Lord. And Lord, may we never stop cheering you and praising you and lifting you up and magnifying you. May we always present you as our God and our King and our Savior and our wonderful, wonderful Lord. Lord, challenge, uh, challenge us in the area of our humility, our, our sacrificial service. Help us with our love. May we be what people need us to be. May we live for Jesus. May we point people to the Savior. And Lord, may we be thankful for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And may it challenge us to live devoted consecrated, committed Christian lives for Christ because of what he's done for us. Help us, God, I pray, uh, with these things. Help us to live for you. Help us to be uh, fully surrendered and submissive to the cause of Christ, I pray. Heads are bowed this morning, eyes are closed, no one's looking. Just a, just a brief invitation this morning. We'll, we'll sing our closing song, make some announcements, we'll go home. You're here today and you'd say, Pastor, first of all, I also am thankful for the cross and, and, and I'm, I, I, I've accepted that sacrifice he made for me on Calvary. And preacher, if I were to die today, I am assured of heaven. Heaven's my home for eternity. And I know that not because I'm a good person or I've been in church or I got baptized or I, I, I followed these laws or these rules. I gave my heart to Christ. I, I put all my faith in what he did for me on Calvary. And the only way I'm getting heaven is because of the way and the truth and the life, which is Jesus Christ. And I know I'm heading my way to heaven because of Jesus. And I've trusted him. Would you do this? Nobody's looking. Would you just slip your hand up? I just want to rejoice with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good, good. Hands all over. Good. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You can put them down. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Most of the crowd, if not all the crowd. But, but I'd be remiss not to ask this in case. Maybe you'd say, I couldn't raise my hand. I'm not sure if I were to die, I would go to heaven. 
I'd like to know that. I know about God. I, I know what you're saying, but I'm not sure. Would you pray for me? I, I won't call your name. I won't embarrass you, but could I pray for you this morning? I'm just not sure. Would you pray for me? Would you do this? Nobody's looking. Just, just slip your hand up, slip it right back down. I want to pray for you in just a minute. I'm just not sure. Would you just pray for me? Anybody at all like that? I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. All right. One last question and then we'll sing. Because of what he's done for us, will you be challenged and motivated this year to live for him? To be what he needs you to be. To promote the cause of Christ. To be committed as a Christian and a, a, a fully so, uh, sold out disciple of Jesus Christ. Will that be your commitment this Easter season? You know, a lot of people give things up for, for Lent or give things up for Easter or give things up for the Holy Week. I'm asking you to do this. How about instead of giving something up, how about we say, I'll make a change. And the change that I'll make is I will surrender my all to Jesus Christ. I'll just do whatever. Yes, Lord, yes, whatever you want. I don't know the need this morning. But as we think about Palm Sunday, we think about what Christ did for us on the cross and this journey that he went through. Boy, I surely, I surely hope that it, it changes our perspective on, on life today. And as we lead up to Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection. I pray that we'll be challenged and motivated to live for Christ. And to point as many people to the Savior as we possibly can. Father, I come to you now and I pray that you'll take what's been said. I pray that you'll use it to help us, encourage us, grow us, and challenge us. We all need to live more for Christ. We all need to be uh, better servants of Christ. We all need to be humble and serve and love. Help us to do so because of what you've done for us on Calvary. And Lord, as we get ready to prepare this week for Easter, uh, prepare our hearts, uh, prepare our church, prepare our community, Lord. And may we be uh, vibrant witnesses and, and, and invite people to come to hear the, the, the glorious news, the resurrecting hope that we have in Christ. May we do what you'd have us to do, Lord. I pray, have your will and way in this invitation. Now we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand with me this morning? We're going to sing just a closing song. I surrender all. I surrender all. As we sing this morning, I pray that you'll sing it from a heart that truly means it as we close our service this morning. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender seated for just one more moment. We're going to make just a couple of announcements. We'll get you out of here just as quickly as possible. We're doing announcement changes to help with our kids transition over here. So, uh, plus my wife said, if you make an announcement at the end, they'll remember them. And I said, no, they won't. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> just remind you, a lot of them are in the bulletin. I'm not going to make them all, so you can look at those. But do want to remind you of a couple of things. Our Faith Promise cards are on the Welcome Center. If you haven't had a chance to turn that in, uh, we are in the process of figuring out what we can do for missions this next year. Uh, right now, I think we are uh, about... $10,000 a year short of last year. Uh, so just so you know, and I'm hoping that's because cards haven't been turned in yet, and that's fine. But uh, so we want to at least stay where we're at so we can continue to support the missionaries we have. Amen? And uh, so if you haven't had a card and prayed about it, get that done, please, if you would, maybe by next week so we can kind of get everything kind of going in the right direction there. And we appreciate that very much. Uh, I want to remind you, of course, next Sunday, uh, total different to our services, we'll have a 6 a.m. sunrise service. Um, tentatively, six o'clock. If that has to change because of the sun rising, we'll let, send out a message. And tentatively, it's going to be here, but I'm working on something special. So uh, I will let you know on that as well. If we have to change that, everybody will be notified. But six o'clock, no Sunday school. 1030 will be our morning service. No evening. All right. Uh, so it's just the one, the one service in the 6 a.m. and the one service at 1030 a.m. And then right after the morning service, all of our kids will have a big old special thing planned in the courtyard. They won't want to miss this. I'm telling you. If you, know, if you know kids that aren't here or have grandkids or something like that, you get them here next week. They're going to experience something like they've never experienced before. You ever seen candy, candy just rain from heaven? 
That's what's going to happen. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, so remember that uh, for next week. Uh, Resurrecting Hope will be our series. We'll start next week. And like I said, that will continue for three more weeks going into April uh, as we continue thinking about overcoming. You ever get, challenge, get big challenges in life? You ever wonder how you're going to make it? Hopefully this series will help us a little bit, all right? And that's kind of the whole purpose of it. So uh, hopefully that will work and help you out there as well. Uh, dinners and stuff for the men's and our ladies, they're coming up here next month. We've got to finish the month out because we already had this month, but those are coming up. Business meetings, all kinds of stuff, that's all in there. So uh, you can look at the rest of those. So um, I don't think I have any other announcements unless I missed something. I don't think I did, but if I did, let me know. But uh, I would like this. Roger, would you come? And Kirk and John. And let me see. Let me get some more help. George. George is always a good helper. Come on, George. Uh, Jay. Corey, you want to help? Give, uh, give Corey some here as well. I want... Hey, uh, Roger, can you give Corey some? Give him, give him a st stack right here as well. I want to make sure everybody gets one. I want everybody in this building, okay, at least the adults. If there's enough for the kids, that's fine too. I want everybody to get at least two of these, if not three. If you'd like three, take more. If you want more, let me know. i got more in the, at the Welcome Center, okay? And then these are just welcome. These are invites to next Sunday and to the next three weeks of the service, okay? So go ahead and just get those passed out, guys. We start at the back and the front, meet each other in the middle, and uh, they'll come around with those. And while they're coming around, I'll just remind you, the easiest thing to do is to hand this to somebody and say, I would love for you to be my guest for Easter Sunday if you don't go anywhere. Bam. Okay? Real simple. Um, and you might be surprised at how many people might give you a positive answer. Amen? I was going to give you all ten, and I thought, that's a challenge, so I'll give you two or three. And if you can do that. I don't know how many people we have in church today with all of our kids and everything. I, we're probably 100-ish. Probably uh, but think about this. If everybody invited two, and only one of everybody's two showed up, Y'all with me? That's another 100 people. Amen? And it's not about numbers, but it is about reaching people with the gospel. Amen? And that might be the only way to get them here is for an Easter service. So uh, we're looking forward to that. We'll have some special music and things going on that day as well. But I uh, encourage you to get out this week and invite people uh, to Easter services and beyond. All right? Anybody need more? If you need more and, didn't, and they only gave you a couple, just let us know. We do have extras. All right. You want to throw those? Uh, uh, what's your name? Roger. You want to just throw the rest of them on the Welcome Center with the others? That way, if people do want to grab more on the way out, they can. If you want to take a stack to Walmart and go hit all the cars in the parking lot, put them under the wipers. Amen. You do what you got to do. Amen. Amen. All right. If you're a guest this morning, I know we had one that came in, right? as Everybody was like swarming everybody, but uh, I'll meet you in the lobby after the service. Well, I got a gift for you for being with us. We appreciate that. I think that's it. All right. Six o'clock tonight, we'll be back. Uh, we're going we're gonna to start April 7th in our evening service. We're going to start a series on real Christianity. The word Christian has been muddied and abused and twisted. And I'm a Christian because I live in America. No, you ain't. All right. And, and I want to really delve into the topic of what's it really mean to be a Christian? And we're going to spend probably 8, 10, 12 weeks maybe just really hitting that, that thing on Sunday nights. But we're going to start tonight with just a series, uh, not even a series, just a one single message on a call to be a real Christian. And I want to look at that from Philippians. So I encourage you to be back tonight at 6 if you can. All right. I'm just going to uh, close with just a quick prayer. And as you pray, uh, we got a special pianist lined up today to play you out. And uh, he'll do a good job there as we get ready to Smith. Joseph, I appreciate you being willing to, to do that for us this morning. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you again. We thank you for your blessings and your goodness. Thank you for the privilege we have to serve you. We ask you to bless us now as we go to our homes. Keep us safe. Bring us back again tonight, Lord, we pray. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.